front and is chair of the European Mathematical Society's Committee of Developing Countries. She's originally from Senegal, but I think she's both Senegalese and French nationality, married with four kids, and completed her PhD at the University of Sorbonne. And it's, they took some positions at uh, University of Paris too. I think she was the first young uh, teaching researcher to be uh, appointed there. Uh, she got uh, an associate professor at the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, Economy and Management of University of Lille 3. And she's chairing this committee that I said and held other positions uh, around uh, both nationally and, and internationally within France. Um, she has uh, a lot of publications and her research is focused on the representation of time and space in random environments through these of stochastic space and time changes. Uh, so she is very deeply involved in and committed to the promotion of women in mathematics, both in Europe and in the developing world. So I guess I just skipped a lot of stuff, but uh, yes. This is the profile of Sophie, and Sophie, we let you take it up from here. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you so much, um, Bakar and you for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to, to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about um, two, let's say, aspect of data science. Uh, namely, I'm going to talk about spatial data science, but also what is named functional data, a high dimension, very big dimension, uh, in particular when uh, the data are spatial nature. Okay. Why do I choose spatial um, data science here? Um, you want to see why, because um, this is... Um, the part of the science down from Africa. Uh, so first of all, I introduce a little bit what is spatial data, and then mainly spatial data science, and the main part of spatial statistics main thinking uh, for real data, the moderate uh, dimension, and then I'm going to move to high dimensional data. Um, name functional functional um, functional data, and in particular, we'd be interested to pre prediction spatial prediction, and um, uh, I will give in detail one application to on the one. And with some let's say hot topics or open question in this topic, spatial and and functional uh, modeling. Okay. Let's begin by uh, a short introduction to, to spatial data. So um, spatial statistics um, come from South Africa, okay? in, in particular uh, from Johannesburg um, with um, Daniel Krieg, who was an engineer from South Africa. Um, during the 15th, she was working on uh, some prediction regression model in order to predict what happened uh, at a given location, um, uh, what may happen at a given location uh, if using if he use information on on neighborhood. So he began to work on uh, a new regression model taking into account some spatial heterogeneity on traction between data. And uh, 10 years after, about 10 years after, um, a mathematician from, um, from Paris, from Mean Paris, uh, George Mataron, um, formalized the model of Daniel Krieg and then proved that this, the prediction uh, Daniel Krieg proposed was the best linear uh, unbiased predictor available. And then he gave this name, this prediction name, uh, Krieg, uh, to thank Daniel Krieg for uh, what he did uh, for spatial statistics. So nowadays, in a number of areas, data are of spatial uh, nature, 
or space or space or temporal um, pool because we we used to collect data at any location, spatial location, uh, um, and then if you add the temporal dimension, then you have spatial temporal data. So I'm very proud to say that this um, very important field of statistics comes from Africa, uh, but it's not so it's not well known in Africa. Okay, when I began after my PhD thesis working on on spatial data. I did not know that this, uh, it comes from Africa, that I discovered this a uh, few uh, years after, and till now I'm still working on this type of data. So let's use very, very actual data. For example, today I take the, the, um, uh, the cumulative case world map uh, for the well-known uh, disease Facebook. And as you see here, uh, at each country, um, each country may be uh, located by the center, for example, if you look at South Africa here, and then you have circles. This, uh, these are typical data, typical spatial, spatial data and space time data, because the day is today, you have the number of cases and at each location, then you have the data. This may be modeled by a process, a space-time space process. The time is fixed here, but the, the location are very, so at each location, then you have the number of Ks, and the number of Ks at two neighborhood may be related. Okay. And then to model the relation, then the spatial component is important. Okay. So what did Fish several years ago is to uh, propose a model taking into account the fact that two, 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 two close locations have some relation. The data the, um, you have to measure at two close locations may have some relation here. So um, to be more general, spatial data are data collected at different locations. So the location depends on on your interest, it may be area, it may be countries, etc. And these data are um, available in a number of fields, like the basic one, soil, uh, soil sciences, the, the oceanography, etc. When you are predicting or you are estimating um, temperature or precipitation in given location then you have spatial data. Uh, in finance also, data may be spatial or space-time data. In diseases like uh, uh, the corona um, virus here, then you have the disease mapping of spreading from one location to, to another location, migration, etc. So the number of area where data are of spatial or space-time nature uh, is very important. So, uh, namely, you can say that spatial statistics include any statistical technique which study phenomena um, observe on a spatial set. And these data are basically they are dependent. Okay? What you observe at two um, neighborhoods may be dependent. And then to model the, the a relation or to have a um, to learn uh, to learn some some information on the data, then it is useful to first find the spatial dependency before before going. So um, let's see. Uh, let's say that S is a special set. It may be the world. It may be a country or whatever you want spatial location, and S is a subset of Rn, okay? So N here is two, is two or larger than two. So the simplest case is two, meaning that uh, the location is, for example, the latitude and longitude. Um, if you add the time, com a time component, then you're gonna, you can have three, the latitude, longitude, and time, etc. Um, so to be simpler, let's say that 
uh, n is is two. Okay, we just have spatial data uh, at um, latitude and longitude. So data you observe, like the coronavirus data, I show you later on, maybe some observation of the spatial process. The spatial process is a family of random variables collected at uh, at this this region, okay? this uh, spatial region or spatial set here, and then we can extend uh, what is usually done in time series analysis. Okay, in time series, then you have n is equal to one, and then you have the time, and you have a certain order of the past, the future, etc. Uh, and then you may be interested to predict what will happen tomorrow, knowing the past. So here the notion of past and future is more complicated because, because the dimension is larger than two, two or larger than two. Then let's think about here a family of random variables located at a given spatial set here. And then this is called a random field or a spatial process. Okay. And we can summarize the three types of the data, the spatial data in three types. Uh, the basic one, the most famous one is geostatistical data, meaning that data are located uh, in a continuous way in R and okay. So here basically this is like geostatistical data. Data are located by latitude and longitude at exact location. Okay. The latest one is basically the, the case of uh, um, the corona data I show you, because here we have aggregated data. Okay, we take South Africa and we count the number of cases at a given time, then we aggregate all the data. South Africa is, let's say, um, the location is the center of South Africa. Okay. Uh, and the last, the third type of process is point process. This is a natural extension of, let's say, Poisson process in in the in a real line. Okay, in this case, the spatial location where the, the phenomenon arrive is random. Compared to the latest and geostatistical data, uh, you have the exact position. So the exact spatial position is not random. The center of South Africa is located. Um, we know the center of South African latitude and longitude, and this is not random. Compared to spatial um, point process, then here the random information is a location. Okay, for example, you have a disease today arrive at some location, and tomorrow we don't know where the disease will be will arrive. So the location where the disease will arrive is is random. Okay, and then depending on the type of data, the questions um, are you may ask are are different. Okay, and sometimes the distinction between latest data and and pure statistical data is a little bit complicated. Okay. Let me show you some some data from 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 West Africa here. Montel data where here uh, the goal is, for example, to, to determine or to predict or map the fish stock in order to avoid some problem like fishing some species um, in some areas or to account the, uh, the impact of climate change on stock, for example. So the, lo the, the points, the black points you, know, you see here are the location where data are collected, okay? And this is usually in every country uh, with um, fish stock. Then the game is to base on the data collected, so to map all these parts, for example, all decision, and then be able to predict what happened here in the in this part where data are not observed. Okay, because it's very complicated and very expensive sometimes to collect data at every location. So this is not possible to collect data at, at every location. So a dumping is um, designed and based on the dumping, then you, uh, you you collect data and then we predict. And based on this, then politics may uh, give some stocks uh, for um, some specific type of, of fish. This is um, exactly another kind of 
data um, based on fish. Uh, on this fish data, for example, uh, here we collect at several depths, several times. So some, what we say here, scan fish data. And this, as you see here, this is this may be complex data with a high dimension, high temporal dimension, but also spatial dimension, with the same goal of predicting or determining fish stock um, mantle problem. A very, a very famous um, data in uh, uh, in soil uh, one here is called the Jura Swiss data. This data uh, is like uh, uh, the data considered by uh, by Krij, the 15th, to do his prediction model. So the as you see here, data may be available at some location, okay? And uh, at the red mark point here, you do not have data and you would like to guess what happened here based on the data collected at uh, neighbor, at the neighborhood location, okay? For example, here you have uh, 100 points, flat point where you have data and uh, at most almost 300 point where you not have data and you would like to predict and to have the best prediction, okay? Another example may be here, image analysis, because since image analysis here, if you look at here, the malaria cell, okay, here you have, I show you a malaria cell, okay? So uh, this image may be decomposed of pixel, and then you can, um, at each pixel by x axis and y axis, then you have the color. The color may be uh, modeled by a realization of, of a field, of a random process, spatial random process. And then this image may be considered an, as an observation of a spatial process. Okay? And then here, for example, if you have a part of the cell not available, so you may be interested to predict a part of the cell or just to determine if the cell is infected or not based on what you observe. Okay. So this is an example of, um, so, the, sorry, the, the, the previous one here is an example of geostatistical data, okay? Because as you see here, we can basically support that the location are continuous in time, okay? Compared to the uh, latest data here, okay, maybe also a case of point process, where here this location is a country, okay? So you aggregate, the data are aggregated. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to, um, to the prediction, the famous prediction method named Krieging, okay? To Krieg. So uh, the Krieging method is, um, as I will show you, uh, when doing parametric model, modeling, okay? You cannot do, you cannot have a, um, a better prediction because this material show that the prediction method proposed by Krieg is the best linear and biased predictor, okay? So when the relation between uh, the, the, the process you would like to predict and, uh, and uh, the, the information you, ha you use, it may be the same process at the other location or any other information. If the relation is linear, namely parametric, then Krieging is the best, the best linear um, prediction method you can have. And you may have uh, some references. A lot of um, books are available on these famous Krieging methods, okay? Namely, for example, you have a more recent one based on uh, Krieging for spatial, but also space-time, space-time Krieging. So Krieging is, like I said before, um, um, was developed for a soil um, application, but it has, it may be used in many, many domains, okay? Basically, it was applied by uh, creation of mining problem. Now you can use it in a number of cases where you have spatial 
spatial component of your data. Okay. So, what do you need to do a prediction like clicking? You have data. The first thing is that you have data located at some location. Let's say you have data with um, latitude and longitude. Let's take the simplest case of your statistics. Then your location are continuous in R. Then you have data, and then you suppose that this spatial data comes from a from a stochastic process, spatial process here, like I name Z, okay, a family of random variables um, located in R N, and you suppose that the process is Gaussian. Okay, this is very important to have the best. Uh, linear and bias estimator. And you suppose some assumption on the moment, the second moment of the process, or this may be relaxed also by um, assuming intrinsic stationarity. So I don't have time to, to go into detail, but what I, I can say is that here, the second order stationarity is, uh, let's say, stationarity based on the mean. It means that the expectation of the process is the same in all the region you are uh, you are dealing with. Let's say that think that uh, the region we are dealing with, the capital S region I defined on, is South Africa. Okay, and then at a given number of location, okay, then you have, for example, the temperature. You measure the temperature at a given number of locations, let's say n location. Okay. And then the hypothesis here, second order, means that the expectation, what you expect at each location, you have exactly the same thing. Okay. But the variance depends on the distance. The variance between two locations depends on the distance between the two locations. This is to summarize the second order stationarity. But this is more, um, this is a little bit restrictive sometimes. And then we can weak this stationarity by using intersex stationarity. The intersex stationarity compared to the second order stationarity, okay, here is supposing that uh, the difference between the, what you observe at two locations, this is stationarity not the process, it's not the process that is stationary, but the difference between uh, two value at, uh, two value of the process at two given location, okay? Namely, for example, um, if you take the Wiener process, if you know the Wiener process, that the Wiener process is not taken all the stationarity, but intersex stationarity. And then with the intersex stationarity, you have more process satisfying this hypothesis in the second order. So this is more realistic in practice. That's why um, to do clicking method, basically we suppose that the process is intersect. If it is second order, it is intersect, but intersect does not imply second order. Okay. So with the data, the model you use on the data, the normality assumption on the process and then some stationarity condition, then you would like to predict what happened at a given location where you do not have data. Let's take the example of temperature later on. You'd like to know the temperature of tomorrow to predict the temperature of tomorrow, let's say at 4 p.m. at this location or a function of temperature given okay, what you observed. Okay? yesterday, for example, at all location. Okay. Sophie, we have a question on the chat. Do you mind answering this for me? Yeah, yes, please. Because Marta just said, how about force order stationarity? What does it mean in reality? Uh, could you repeat, please? How about first order stationarity? Oh, first what does order. it mean in reality? First order, yes. Okay, the first order stationarity is not very realistic because if you use only the first order stationarity, then you are not able to account the variance between two uh, two process. 
because the first order stationarity is only based on the mean, not on the variance. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, um, okay. So can I say that I um I I have temperature uh, at a given number of location where you have station, for example, you have station, and then you uh, you measure the exact not exact you measure the data given the temperature at this location given by the station you have there, and since you cannot have station at every location in the country, then you would like to map all the, all the, you would have to have a map of all South Africa for the temperature at a given day. So you use the data available to predict what happened here. Okay. And since you're doing predictions, you would like to have the best prediction. So using the second order stationarity or intrusex stationarity, let's say the weakest one, intrusex stationarity, then you, you are able to define a covariance or variogram. The variogram is, uh, is used in the case of intrusex. So let's say variogram because it's simpler. The variogram is this one, okay? This guy, gamma H is a half of the variance between the difference between ZS plus H minus ZS. So look at this guy. It means that here you take the process at a fixed location, then you, you, you add H, okay? Here H is in R and like, uh, like S. Meaning that uh, the distance, let's say, so, so distance between S plus H and S is H, okay? So with the distance of H, we're going to take the azeotropic one to, to simplify the problem. So this variance is able to say that the temperature is not constant over all South Africa. Okay, it may they, there are some variation um, if we move in the country. Okay, so this guy is very important for doing trading okay? because this guy permit to have to to take some weights, okay, based on what you, on what you have, uh, the data you observe. Let me explain a little bit. Let's say an example of, of a variogram. Okay, so you have several, several model, several variogram model available on the literature, and we focus just on the exponential one. In that, if we suppose that gamma h is this function, okay, this exponential function, it means that uh, the covariance, the variance, this difference, okay, okay, at at h, okay. Then you have, if h is larger than a, this constant a, then the covariance, the variogram is is very high, meaning that there is no correlation between the two location. If the two location the distance is this guy, okay? And if this is larger than H, then there is no correlation. We do not need to use all the data at the same level to do prediction, okay? It is like, um, uh, let's think about the covariance between two variables. You have the covariance between two variables or the correlation between two variables. If the correlation is very close to zero, then you have no correlation. Uh, uh, if it is close to one in absolute value, then you have some correlation. So this guy here is like if H, if the norm of H is larger than A, so there is no spatial correlation or spatial dependency between uh, the two location with distance H, okay? And um, can I ask a question quickly? Yes. Are you given A or do you yes. know A already? A, A, A is given. A is given. Okay. So if you have data, you have to find the best A. Okay. Oh, I find the best the best model. Here I just show you an example of exponential, but it may be Gaussian, it may be more complicated one, spherical, etc. So if you give the model, if you fit, if you say that the dependency is um, like an exponential one, okay, this is the model, and then you have to find A and C0. 
Oh, I see. Okay. So these are probably parameters you can learn from your data. Yes, you can learn from your data. Yes. Okay. okay. So yeah, uh, there's another question. Azuma Karim said, is it possible to achieve mean stationarity on the location since they are measured from different longitude and latitudes? Mean stationarity? What do yes, you mean? on the location. At the location? He said, is it possible to achieve mean stationarity on the location since they are measured from different longitude oh. and latitude? The stationarity is is uh, you should have stationarity. If you do not have stationarity, then you have to uh, to 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 do stationarity before. If your data are, if the model here, I suppose that we have stationarity, second order intersect. So if you have data and you know that your data are not stationarity, so you know, then you have to 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 uh, to make them stationary. Okay. A very typical case of non-stationarity is, for example, if the process, uh, if the temperature vary, if there is a variation in mean in your space, let's say that this variation is like, uh, is a function, is, is a linear function of latitude and longitude. So you have to estimate this linear function and then to relate it to the process, to take the stationary, the stationary process. And then you do your prediction with the stationary process and then after that, you add your, um, your what I say, trend. You add your trend that is not stationary. I see. She also said, how do one account for any relationship of spatial location and time? OK, this is space-time location. For space-time prediction, this, this prediction model I'm summarizing is extended to the space-time case. As you see here, I take S in R N. So N here basically is two in the spatial case. In the space time case, it is three. And in this case, so the gamma here, we have to split the gamma in two components, the spatial one and the time one. I see. It's a bit more complicated. So in general, mm. let's say that N may be larger than two. Okay, and then I, I, will, I will give you after, after after this part a number of um, of software where you can find um, some explanation how to do it in time and space time case. Okay, okay. Let me go back a little bit here. Look at this this guy, this variogram gamma h. This is a variance. If you delay it to two, okay. Let's say we take two here. This is a variance. So a naive estimate of the variance is, we know that if you are estimating a variance and you take, if you have the, the observation is ZS1, ZS2 to ZSN, okay? So what you can do is to take um, the empirical variance, okay? The empirical variance and you take uh, one of N, the sum of ZSI minus the mean square, okay? So since it is the variance, but not a very typical variance because you are taking the variance for all location distant to its edge. So if you take two location SI and SK, okay, in some neighborhood of, so that the distance is some neighborhood of edge, then the, a basic estimate, an empirical or non parametric estimate is this guy. This is me meeting the, the empirical variance, okay? But the problem is, with this empirical estimator, it comes from the naive um, uh, empirical variance. This is not a variogram function, okay? Because the variogram, so I, here I speak many details. A variogram function uh, may be conditionally definite positive, and this is not the case. So this estimation, it may give you some idea of the variability, but this is not a variogram function, okay? Like when you're doing, when you do um, uh, density estimation, you have your data and you would have to have some information on the distribution, then you take the histogram. If your density is continuous, you know that the histogram is not a good estimation because it's not continuous, but it, it is a simple uh, guy that permit you to have an idea of, of your, on your distribution before using a kernel one or more sophisticated one. So this empirical estimation of the variance 
is the first thing to estimate when we are dealing with a variogram. It permits to have an idea of the variability, but it is not, let's say, a good estimator because it's not definitely positive. Then you can use it and then find, learn with your data the best model. Let's, let's say that here the best model is exponential one. Let's say that with the data we have exponential one, then we first estimate the empirical one and then find the best parameters A and C0 from exponential one close to this one. And afterward, this is going to be the model we are going to use to do prediction. Okay, am I clear? Just to summarize, in other words, Let's look at this figure, okay? So here I put, I simulate a theoretical, um, I, sim I simulate um, a Gaussian process, spatial process with an exponential variogram. And then I estimate with some data, the empirical one. So a, a variogram function should be something like this, okay? Then you have what is called the range. This range is this A, okay? So after, if you have two, two, two location where the observation, uh, uh, two location where the distance is larger than A, then there is no correlation. So after this range here, six, then you see that the variogram is converged to what we call the sin, okay? So after six, the dependence is very weak. And then you have here what we call the negative. If you have some error term on your process, then you have the variance of the error term, this is called the negative, okay? And this is so the T0, the variance of the, um, of the, sorry of the nugget, the error term is, uh, is called the nugget. And then plus this part, then you have the seal. The seal is, uh, is the value, the convergence value, okay? If the variogram, um, if the variogram is larger than, than six, then you're gonna have some convergences here. The limit of the variogram is converged to the seal here, one, I fix to one, okay, right? Now, go back to the prediction, the clicking method. So here, let's say you have S0 here, you not have data here and all the black part, the, the, the white parts. And what you have is like uh, here, the black here. And you would like to guess what happened here or to predict depending on the data you have, okay? So let me denote by uh, Z here the end observation of the process. So the clicking, uh, the clicking of Z at S0 is finding the best linear unbiased predictor. U is unbiased predictor, okay? Naming that we are trying to find um, the best, the optimal predictor depending on some loss function of the process at the location S0. This is the prediction we are looking for based on the data, okay? And then this loss function, let's take the famous square loss function. And then we know that with this square loss function, the optimal predictor is the expectation of that is zero, knowing the observation that is that S1 to that SN, okay? So if we take, this is well known in statistic, uh, the square loss function, and then this is the optimal predictor, okay? So since we are looking for linear, optimal linear and unbiased, okay? So the predictor should be linear and then Basically, we have three type of predictor. Just going to summarize the um, 
The famous one, okay, in the case where the, the model is the process is stationarity, namely, let's say that that S is like this one, mu plus the process epsilon S. So epsilon S is intrusic, mu is not known. The expectation of epsilon S is zero, this one said. It means that here, if you take the expectation of ZS, so this is equal to mu. Name, let's say that ZS is the temperature. It means that the temperature in the whole region, South Africa, the expectation mm -hmm. is mu. And then since we suppose that epsilon S is intrusic, then ZS is also intrusic. Then the variance of ZS plus H minus ZS depend only on H. This is a function of gamma, of the, of the, the variogram, gamma H. So the ordinary key being proposed by Daniel Kirsch is like this one. Since he was interested to put a linear predictor because linear is very simple compared to nonlinear. So you take this expectation, or this, this average, average, okay? Lambda i, zsi, and to be optimal, so with uh, the square loss function, so with expectation of z is zero, uh, knowing the observation is the optimal one. And since we suppose that uh, the data, the process is Gaussian, then the optimal one is the best linear predictor. So we have to, to add the unbiased hypothesis, so since we are looking at, go down, go a little bit, looking at a predictor, this one, the best one means the optimal one, and the unbiased, okay? So linear, the two at the contrary, the optimal one mean that the variance, one, the variance of the predictor minus the value we are predicting, okay, is the minimum, okay? And then it is unbiased, meaning that the expectation of that hat, the prediction is equal to the expectation of the real value, okay? So linear, unbiased, and the best uh, compared to the loss, the square loss function. And then if you have these three, linear, unbiased, and optimal, then you have the system, okay? You write down what is this, if you replace this by this one, then you take the lambda i, such that you have the minimum, and then this is um, uh, unbiased. And this system permit to have the solution. So to do ordinary cleaving, when you support that your process is stationary, namely here in TruSec, mean that the, your process is like this one, mm -hmm. the mu is constant, and then the epsilon is centered and intrusic. So the best unbiased linear predictor is a linear predictor like this one, such that the lambda i verifies this system. Okay? And the lambda i are said that the sum is equal to one. If you take this, the last line applied by this, then the sum is equal to one. Okay? And then the other parts mean that you have the minimum. So numerically, you just have, if you identify the best gamma function, okay, you learn from your data, and then you, you, you know the best gamma function. So numerically, you have to, to solve this equation to find the lambda i. Okay. Have questions? Okay. And then related to the question uh, we asked before, if mu is, if mu depend to s, okay, don't have stationary in the mean here, mu s, then you have to estimate mu s. Let's say the simplest one is that uh, mu s is um, 
is a function of s. You have to estimate mu s. If you, when you estimate mu s, then you have to subtract that s to mu s, and then you have an estimation of epsilon s. You do clicking with the, the, the estimation of epsilon s, okay? And afterwards, and you can you replace to have the clicking of that s. This is called universal clicking, okay? So universal clicking is a more complicated one with, uh, with no stationarity on the data. And then in practice, data are not always stationary. So uh, universal clicking is, uh, uh, is very useful, but universal clicking is like ordinary clicking after estimation of, of, of the trend here, of the, of the mean, right? And there is another model named, um, clicking model named simple clicking. But the simple clicking is not realistic because it supports that you know the mean in all the, on the region you consider, for example, you know the temperature mean in all South Africa, this is not very realistic. And then you know also the variability of the temperature in all South Africa, okay? Right? No. So after you, you estimate, you do your prediction, then, uh, you can calculate the variance of clicking. The variance of clicking is this, um, the variance of the error, okay? Because this is the error, the prediction minus the, the real value, the true value. So this is the error. And this, after finding your lambda, uh, after finding the lambda, okay, after computation, and then you have your lambda, then you are able to have the variance of clicking this variance of clicking permit to uh, to see the the quality of the prediction, okay? Because in a linear model, linear prediction you cannot do uh, better than this one, okay? So basically, all software give also the prediction combined with uh, uh, the variance of the error term, the clicking variance. Just a few remarks before moving on. So. Um, Tell you that the, the sum of lambda is equal to one, okay? If you take the, this last equation, the sum of lambda is equal to one, um, but this doesn't mean that all lambda are, um, are less than one, okay? Oh, let me get the time, I have plenty of time, okay? So this is a, I, but I few um, very short, I hope, description on what is a creaking prediction, linear prediction. Right? So you can find a um, number of sources, paper published, scientific events, journals, societies. So spatial data science is, um, is a very dynamic field, okay? And then you have high number of papers published since uh, the seminal paper of um, the PhD of, of, of Daniel Kirch, a master PhD, the seminal paper of, uh, of Materon. And then every year you have a lot of, lot of um, scientific events on spatial data or space science. Um, you have more than 100 free R, Python, MATLAB software available, and then web pages. Um, for example, if you are interested to look at your statistical modeling, then you have a page of or um, aggregate data, let's say latest data, then you have the MATLAB resources of James Lesage. Esri also propose a lot of um, a lot of software on web page, app, this also, etc. So if you are interested to learn a little bit or to investigate spatial data science, so, so you can look at one of these resources or you can email me if you want, I can give some, some references, right? So now uh, let's move to uh, the, the work I, I did last year with some of my colleagues on space-time functional clicking. And for that, uh, let me introduce what is functional data, okay? Before that. So to motivate, let's have a look at this data on spatial global radiation, where here in um, in um, in Guadeloupe, 
we had some what three station as you know here the the spatial component is very sparse because we have three location and then we have time data here we have space time data with sparse spatial because we have just three location but the temporal dimension is very high what we observe is at each location so it's very expensive to build this global radiation station so we have three global radiation on each part of this loop and what you would like to we aim to do here is to predict the spatial global radiation at a given location where we do not have a station okay to be able to to to, to have uh, energy for example so as you see here the time dimension here is very high okay it is larger than 1000 okay and then the location the spatial dimension is not very high okay okay so spatial data is um not so new but it has only 20 years it is only 20 years old um spatial location is some extension of time series analysis when you do when you are doing time series then you um take the the time data and then you put it you have the observation as at, at t1 t2 etc till tn spatial data does not cut the curve it takes the old curves of, as a functional random variable or an observation of a functional random variable. And let's think about a function, let's say a square integrable function in zero t, for example, okay, in a time domain. So this is a function, function, function on a functional space of square integrable function on the time dimension zero t. So the space where the function takes values is a space of infinite dimension, okay? Because the space of all continuous or square integrable function on zero t is infinite dimension, okay? So you are dealing with a guy in an infinite dimensional space. It's not really big data, but infinite dimension. But in practice, so we cannot know, we cannot work on infinite dimension, but I, I will show you how we can manage to do that. So here we consider that that the three curves we have the three curves each curve is only a data one data living in a complicated space a complicated functional space that may be a banach space or a metric space or a hilbert space another example is here also space time data where you have uh, more than 100 uh, monitoring station okay in us and then you record um, here ozone concentration during a certain period of time, okay, like here. And here each curve is a temporal curve. And then we, we consider also that, like before, each curve is a functional guy, an observation of a function, okay? Meaning that here uh, the sample size is 100. And each guy lives in a functional space of infinite dimension. So we have spatial components and also we have functional component because each data, each curve is a data located at, um, at some location. Another one is um, in hydrology um, where uh, we deal here with daily stream flow curve okay, at some given location in, um, in Quebec. So this is some data I work on in a paper in 2012. And so at a given location, then you have a curve like this, okay? Hydrograph curve, <coughs> permitting to measure the temporal evolution of the fluid, okay? And if you take all the curve during a several number of years, okay? Then you have several functional data or you can have a long functional data, okay? Like here also, the, the, the aim may be to, <coughs> to model the time evolution in order to predict what will happen uh, one day based on the past and on data located at neighborhood location, okay? So to, um, to define 
in a simple way what is functional data. Let's say that a random variable x is named functional variable if it takes values in a space, in a functional space, or namely in finite dimensional space. Okay, basically it may be x is xt, t living in capital T here. So this capital T may be R, like the temporal case of fluid data or, um, or global regression data in time. It may be also R2 or R3, etc. Okay, X may be an image or it may be something more complicated, right? So here the data is living in a functional space, in finite dimensional space, like square integrable function in, in, uh, in T here. Okay? And then instead of cutting the curve at several points, then we take all the dynamic of the curve and, uh, um, and we aim to, um, let's say, to explore all the dynamic of the curve uh, for modeling goal, for example. Uh, and this field is a very dynamic also, young but very dynamic, and nowadays a lot of work um, right on functional and spatial, combining functional component and spatial component also, okay? And uh, here you have um, a literature on what is going on in this field. So, um, all the statistical fields like um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, etc., are um, um, are also exploring functional data, change point classification, regression, etc. And you have a number of books available on these fields. Uh, and if you are interested, then you can look at uh, the very recent. Um, very recent review of uh, of Martinez and Gentle on, on spatial functional functional data modeling. Okay. So, so to do uh, clicking with functional data, okay. Let me focus now on on functional and spatial spatial components. So, uh, most of the work available in functional data are for independent data. Okay. So uh, recently, um, so the research working on functional data moved to independent from independent to dependent data, like uh, um, the data I show you on on uh, the ozone concentration uh, in US. If you look at two near station, okay, it may think then that the daily concentration of an are similar. Okay. So to be able to predict the maximum or daily concentration ozone at a location where you don't have a station, then uh, you may use um, a correlation or variogram to estimate the dependency and then take it into account in the prediction model. Okay. So for spatial data, spatial geostatistical data, um, some recent work exists on Kriging. Uh, parametric, but also non-parametric, uh, on latest data also, but a lot of things remains to be done in these fields in functional spatial modeling. So the uh, the model, the functional clicking I'm going to present you is motivated by some um, some data from Colombia um, in a paper. I published two years ago with some collect from Colombia. So here we can see the daily temperature recorded at a number of stations. Okay, here we have, um, and then we have at each location we have a high number of of temporal data. Okay, meaning that from January 1980 to December um, 2015, we record data at each station. So this is the time dimension and this is a spatial dimension. Okay. Instead of considering um, the time data as um, time series, we take 
we take them as functional data, okay? Meaning that we suppose that each curve at each, each temporal curve for a given look, a temporal curve for, for a given location is a functional guy, okay? And then we use, we extend what is done by Kriging to functional, to the functional case, okay? So this because the high volume of the data here is used, okay? So let me show you the data on. As you see here, you have the location, all the location where data are available. And here I point out the red point, okay? At this red point, I know the data available here, okay? But I delete it from the sample and I would like to recover the data based on what is available on the other location. And this is the curve you have at each location. It's the black, black point here, spatial location, okay? And this one, this red point is a S0 point where I would like to predict, okay? It may be also another point here in the, in the white part where data is not available and then doing mapping in all, in, in all the region, okay? So let's, um, let's model the data as functional one. So here I take X as a spatial, functional process, so X is XS, X is a function. So S is a location. I suppose that this process, okay, each variable of this process is valued in a metric space, okay? A metric space or semi-metric space with the a metric or semi-metric. Namely here, let's think about epsilon, the, the space here, Capital epsilon is, let's say, uh, the square integrable function on zero t, okay? Where zero t is the time domain you have here, okay? Meaning, in other words, the time, the time domain here, okay? January 1st in 1980 to December 2015, okay? So each curve, is an observation of a functional, functional process, functional head value process. So this space here where XS lives is a space of infinite dimension, okay? Typically, um, it is a space of function, for example, defined define on this time interval, zero T, okay? If T, zero T is the domain I will talk later on. So X is observed at a given number of location, the number of location I show you one, okay, you have one, and then the time domain is this one. In practice, the data is discrete, right? In practice, then we have T1 to TD. In practice, the data are discrete, but you are not interested to use the discrete data. So we convert the discrete data to smooth data to a function before applying uh, this functional methodology, right? So in practice, we have this type of data. Little x, s, i, t, g, this is the data I have like this, this one. In practice, I have this data, okay? So I, um, we first, transform this data to functional data before doing the prediction. Okay? So this is the typical point of functional data. We like to work with the smooth curve and not the discrete curve. So the red point, the red point as zero show you where I would like to estimate the curve here. See the curve is transformed as the, um, the the available data to functional to functional data before going on. So a first step in functional data analysis is to transform the discrete data to continuous data, okay, to functional data. So I name um, little x the discrete data, and then these two data are transformed to functional data. 
This may be done by smoothing, for example, by using spline, wavelet, etc. Okay, by using Fourier analysis to do. So first step is to do that. After doing that, then we have data as curves. And this leaves this data lives in a functional dimensional space, like this one, for example. Let's say that I suppose that uh, the functional space is the function of, of the space of all unprovable function, square unprovable function in zero t. Okay. The dimension of this guy is infinite, and in practice, I cannot work with an infinite dimension. So I have to span this in a basis function. Okay, each functional guy is span in a expand in a basis function like Fourier or relevant uh, basis function. And then this, this is uh, called dimension reduction, okay? From infinite dimension to finite dimension reduction, but the object we are dealing with in this finite dimension are function. Namely, you have, have infinite dimension, then you take a basis function of your space, the number of functions is infinite, and then let's say that you take finite number of this function. The simplest case, for example, is three. With three, the first three basis function, then you expand your functional data. And then now you have dimension three. Instead of having in the time domain a high dimension of discrete point, then you may have a finite number of dimension in a functional space. Maybe the simplest case is to use the PCA, principal component, functional principal component analysis may permit to have, for example, a reduced number of function. And then you can now work with a finite, finite number of function of this complicated space. Okay. So a lot of technique to, to choose the number of the number of function, for example, by cross validation. So namely, if I summarize. So we have space-time domain, space-time data, where the time domain is very high, okay? More than here, uh, 10,000, it's very high. So instead of taking this high dimension, we transport the problem to an infinite dimension by taking the data of realization of functional random variable, a more rich function, of course, a more rich space. This is more rich than the time dimension, and we aim to focus on just a finite part of this space, a finite number of function. And then we're going to work with this finite number of function to do prediction, for example, here to do, to, to do um, clearing. OK? So to extend what, what is done in real valued clearing to functional case, then we have to redefine what is variogram. Okay, because the variogram I show you later on is a variogram of a real value, okay, or multivariate. But here, since we have function, okay, x is a function, okay, then we have to define variogram. What is variogram means in this case? Suppose that x is second order. It may be also intersect, okay? Let's say second order. So for each t, so the expectation is constant. It's not expectation as uh, expectation of e x s t does not depend on s, okay, and the mean function is measurable on t. For couple of t t, t prime s s prime, so look at the variance here. Let me make uh, the variogram later on. The variance of x s t and x s prime t prime. Know that this depends only on s minus s prime. This is the t, the temporal dimension, and this is the spatial dimension. Okay, so this variogram depends on t and t prime, meaning that in this case we have several variogram function, several variogram function. So for different time period, and uh, this is the distance. Let's say the distance between the two location s and s prime. So here, this extends 
the basic variogram of Krish and Macheron to a functional phase. Okay, namely, this is a little bit um, more general than the space-time variogram. So, based on this, we uh, use, let's say, an aggregate variogram to have something more simpler than this this space-time one. Okay, this no, the, this space-time was is more complicated to estimate. So here, what is defined in functional data, spatial functional data, is the trace variogram. The trace variogram is the integral of the variogram on the time domain. Okay, and then back to Guinea, we can look at the, the, the variogram at this guy. Okay, this trace variogram is this guy. So we have to learn from the data like before uh, the correct trace variogram to use in the prediction. So like the empirical basic variogram, so we can estimate, since this is a variance, we can estimate the trace variogram very simply, okay? That in practice, we have the integral, though we have to deal with the integral in this case. So only the integral is make the difference because the guys we are dealing with here are function, x, x uh, are function and not univariate or multivariate. Just to move on because time is running. So the orderly functional Krieging um, proposed, the proposed paper is this one. Let's say the, the, the simplest case ordinary, but universal is also possible. So is this expectation, is this, sorry, is this, um, is this weighted mean weighted by lambda i? Like before, we are searching for lambda i, this weight lambda i, said that the predictor is, um, is unbiased and is the best one. So the best one here, since our, our data are functional, then we have to use this, this integral, okay, to the expectation of the integral on the time domain, okay? And then we use this trust variogram. So estimate, searching for this lambda i to solve these two equation mean that we have this uh, solution as function of this, um, uh, this uh, this solution, okay? Numerically, uh, to to so to compute the, this lambda one in practice, then we need to deal with the integral. We need first to um, let's say to to um, to make the data functional, okay, and then to expand the data in a finite number of function in the functional space we are dealing with before being able to find the lambda i and the prediction. Okay, so it is proven in the literature that this predictor is the best, like um, like the one of k is the best linear predictor uh, in this case. And we can do better than uh, the space time when the dimension, the temporal dimension is very high. For example, here with only three principal component function, we are able to do better than uh, the, the high di temporal dimension, okay? But in a more complicated space, this is a, a functional space. So the, the variance is uh, like before uh, uh, this one, just kicking. And then show you here, as you know, uh, the, the black curve is the, is the, um, um, is the picture of the, if you remember the red point where S0, where uh, the prediction uh, where I was interested to do prediction, this is the one obtained, okay? And, and with the, uh, the best error compared to, um, compared to the multivariate prediction with the time, temporal time, uh, space time, sorry, uh, prediction, like com in, in practice takes a lot of time. Um, and uh, so here, the advantage of using the functional, the functional kicking compared to the space-time kicking when the time dimension is very high, is that you do not 
uh, need to support that you have separability to measure the spatial and the temporal dependency. In space-time cleaning, real value to space-time cleaning, then the best way to estimate the variogram is to support that you have a separation between uh, the temporal variogram and, and the spatial variogram. Here, there is no separation. And also, you do not need to fix the dimension at the beginning, okay? You take all the dynamic of the curve, you not need to say, okay, I divide the data by day, day by day. You take all the curve and then you support that this is smooth, okay? And then you, you do smoothing to take the functional data. And with this functional data, then you choose the best number of function of, uh, in the functional space where your data lives to be able to find the best predictor, okay? Um, and now some paper uh, extend this prediction model to cockrigging. Cockrigging means that you would like to predict, what you would like to predict does not depend only on the process you are dealing with, but on other processes, okay? For example, the temp you would like to predict the temperature, but you need also the wind speed, et cetera, other information for to do the prediction. Okay, you, you add covariate to do prediction compared to the trigger. Okay. And just to finish a number of hot topics to investigate, if you are interested to uh, spatial functional or spatial space, space spatial functional data or spatial functional data science, then um, there is absolutely nothing on continuously indexed spatial process, okay, for real data, real value data. You consider a process that has uh, valued in R, okay, and S has a temporal, uh, a temporal dimension, and the time is continuous Almost, um, I know that in the non-parametric part, a few number of paper exist, but in the parametric case, it's very complicated. Um, non-parametric space-time modeling is also a very dynamic field, okay? Because um, it's a very dynamic field because when doing creaking, then you support that the relation is linear because your prediction is linear, but sometimes, the linear hypothesis is not very realistic. So non-parametric uh, estimation may be an alternative to parametric one, okay? Uh, and this is very young. This field is very young in spatial statistics. Uh, space functional modeling also, okay? Because uh, if you take each year, for example, here I take um, the temporal element is for several years, but if I'm interested to estimate for a given year, um, for several years, sorry, uh, the temperature at a given location for a given for a given time, okay, then this may be more complicated than what I show you on. Survival analysis also in a non parametric part is a new demand, and you can find some a recent review, a recent review, the one I talk later on, with Martinez and Gentle and a recent monograph book uh, published, I think two months ago. And uh, mm. I think I can stop here. I don't know if I. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, Patrick, you are sharing your screen. Can you on screen? On share your screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Sophie, uh, for a brilliant talk. Um, uh, we've gone a bit above time, and I'm glad people are still here. It must be really interesting for people to be here. Any questions? We could start from uh, Azuma's questions. He had a question earlier when you finished the post, first part of your talk. He said, could you, could you kindly guide one how to obtain the variance as the minimum? This is for the spatial. Oh. Data. Stop. Where you saw this? Uh... Oh, Paka, could you please re uh, repeat the question? Let's see. Oh, let me see. Say, could what? you kindly guide one 
how to obtain the variance as the minimum? Oh, the variance at the minimum. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can share my my black my iPad to use my blackboard. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, we're already above time. If it's going to be complicated, you may okay. not have to worry about it. You can but take it off. You can, to, to you can have, write to you. Yes, hmm. to have the the minimum variance then you just have to minimize. Say that uh, the prediction lambda uh, dead uh, hat uh, is uh, the sum of lambda i, z, s, i, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you have to minimize the expectation of uh, this, um, this mean minus uh, uh, the real value, we do not know. So you have just to, um, to find the lambda that minimizes this sum of square. Yeah, I guess what's happening is you're reformulating the problem in a Lagrangian form. Yes. That's why you have the, the Lagrange multipliers. So that's, yeah. Yes. So yes. it's an optimization problem. It is very simple. So you, you can write down, it's very simple. OK, any other questions? Uh, Marta also asked a question. Is it possible to compare functional creeding to Kalman filters? To kernel? Uh, to kernel, yes. Uh, yes, yes, it is. Because functional Kriging... I mean, I mean Kal Kalman filter. Kalman. Oh, Kalman filter. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because, we, yes, because what we are doing in the first part of, of Kriging uh, is a little bit, functional Kriging is a little bit uh, very similar to Kalman filter. Yes, we can. Okay. So if I understand you correctly, I, so I had this question in mind. If I understand you correctly, in the first part, you say if you have a space time, you can add the time as a space component. And in the second, the functional case, you say, no, I'm going to take the time and then write it as a function of my space. First, I, I approximate this discrete uh, function by a continuous one, and then do the clicking. Is that what's happening? Do you think uh, yes. one can, work, work can uh, solve the same problem using the two different methods? And how would, your, how would the, result, uh, the solutions compare? OK. Yes, we can solve the problem by using the two different methods. If, if I use the real value Kriging, so it means that uh, um, I fix the time, OK? I, I, I want to predict the temperature tomorrow at a given location using the temperature um, at the same location a day before, for example, okay? And then if you would like to predict for other day, you have to do another prediction, okay? You have to repeat the prediction mm -hmm. uh, D time, because remember that D here is uh, more than 3,000. Three, 3, but if you take the functional, the functional Kriging, then you take all the curve, all the time curves, Okay, and what you have, the prediction you have is a whole curve for whole, all the period of time you, you, you consider. Then you combine time and space and uh, the, the, the result is a curve. And if you take the real valued case, then the result is a point. And have you repeat, you have to repeat several times to have uh, a certain number of time points. And each time you have to estimate the variogram, etc. So there is no multivariate version of the spatial data thing that you one can use instead of just doing one point at a time. You yes. do multivariate. Multivariate exists. Okay. Multivariate exists. Uh, but when 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 using multivariate in this space time case, okay, it means that um, you are doing co rigging because you are using uh, the other time as covariate, okay? And this also, you cannot combine all the time because the dimension is going to be very, very large and you're going to have correlation among the covariate and then you, you're going to have other problems. But, uh, and we compare here, but if we compare what we did with functional to multivariate case, if the dimension okay. is not very high, then you don't need to do functional because no gain. But if the di the time dimension is very high, uh, then functional may be an alternative. Maybe. Okay, good. 
Uh, we have a question. Inga, you want to ask your question? You can unmute yourself. Thanks, Prof. Uh, thanks. That was really a wonderful talk. Um, uh, yeah, I just want to ask you, because you mentioned COVID data a few times. Um, have you done, have you applied this to any COVID modeling in um, sort of at a more local scale, at a country scale, to predict within countries? Yes, I, 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 I use it in France for French data. And then I have a PhD oh. working on, um, on, on in a European point of view. Oh, wonderful. That's very, so because we're doing a, um, not, not a, we're doing a SEI or a spatial model for South Africa. So, um, I'm, and I've seen very few actual spatial modeling of COVID. It seems to be more isolated um, to specific locations. So it will, but I will, I'll, I'll have a look at your work. That sounds very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've been here for about one and a half hours now. I think we should let the speaker go now. Let's thank the speaker one more time and thank everyone for being here and looking forward to our next talk. Thank you Thank so you. much. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Sam, you may somewhere in Samson, you may stop recording now. Sure. Okay. Good. Bye.